Hello, welcome to the White House. Welcome to you here with us and, and welcome to those who are watching across the country. Uh, I'm Mike Stratmanis and I am counselor to senior advisor to the president, Valerie Jarrett, a great job. And I wanna welcome you to a special White House Open for Questions event with The Root. Last week, the White House released a report called Creating Pathways to Opportunity, a report highlighting the work that President Obama has done to date to help Americans climb the ladder to the middle class and stay there. The report outlines the critical investments this administration has made to lift and keep millions of Americans out of poverty, provide critical support to families throughout the economic downturn, and invest in long-term reforms to grow the middle class. It also outlines the direct impact the American Jobs Act would have on underserved communities across the country. And that's why we're here today, to take your questions for the next 45 minutes about what the Obama administration is doing to help communities like yours across the country. As you know, The Root has invited you to pose questions to senior White House officials on the issues you care most about. So let me quickly introduce our panelists. And then I'll turn it over to Cynthia Gordy from The Root to jump right into questions. To taking your question today, we have two of President Obama's top advisors, and it's my privilege to introduce them to you. They are my boss, <laughs> Valerie Jarrett, senior advisor to the president, a woman who is in the room when every critical decision is made here in this White House, and Melody Barnes, director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, a woman who has been at the center uh, of forging domestic policy accomplishments and priorities for this president and for this administration. Now, before I hand things off to Valerie, Melody, and Cynthia, I want to give you a couple of important websites where you can find additional information today and going forward. The first one has a variety of information on the American Jobs Act, including fact sheets, blog posts, and videos. That website is www.whitehouse.gov slash jobs act. That's whitehouse.gov slash jobs act. The second has more information on this groundbreaking pathways to opportunity report, and that site is whitehouse.gov slash opportunity. That's whitehouse.gov slash opportunity. At these sites, you'll find more information on the topics that are being discussed today, and I sure hope you'll check them out. Now, let me turn it over to Cynthia. Thank, thank you, you, Michael. Um, and thanks, Valerie Jarrett, Melody Barnes, and our audience with us today. I'm Cynthia Gordy, Washington reporter for The Root. Uh, TheRoot.com is a black news and perspective site that offers a fresh take on breaking news, as well as solid analysis on politics, social issues, and culture. And we're so pleased to be here today to talk not only about jobs and the American Jobs Act, but also an issue that's so often avoided by political figures, and that is poverty. Um, we asked our readers to submit questions based on the challenges around poverty, as well as what the administration is doing to confront those challenges. Um, and for those joining us online, you can still submit questions now on Twitter by using the hashtag TheRootsWH. That's TheRootsWH. So let's open the discussion with the reader question. This comes from Eldon Pittman Jr. And he asks, what does the administration consider to be the biggest contributor to poverty today, and how are you confronting that issue? Well, that's a pretty easy one, jobs. And that's why the president is so forcefully pushing to pass the American Jobs Act. Everybody has to have a job. If you have a job, that's your pathway out of poverty. And the American Jobs Act, I'll just take a second to outline it in broad parameters, because uh, it is so simple and so persuasive, which is why the president has enjoyed traveling around the country, talking about the American Jobs Act, and it's resonating broadly around the country. So simply put, for small businesses, and we all know that small businesses are, ec are our economic engine, in all of our communities. It would provide for cutting the payroll tax in half. We also have an incentive if you hire people who have been unemployed for more than six months, businesses would get four th about $4,000 per person because we know there's a big challenge and there are companies around the country who are actually discriminating against people who are long-term unemployed. So this provides a positive incentive and we're also gonna put some teeth in our laws to prevent the discrimination against people who are long-term unemployed. 
We're also extending unemployment insurance in the American Jobs Act for those families who have lost their jobs and just need that little extra bit to carry them over. Unemployment insurance will expire at the end of the year, so we want to have that put back in place. There are uh, programs in there to provide for uh, infrastructure. The construction industry was so hard hit by the most recent downturn. We want to rebuild our roads and our bridges, our schools. There are funds in there for 35,000 schools around the country to be renovated. We have to do what we can to bring our schools up to good repair, as well as the rest of our infrastructure, and produce jobs in, this, in the same time. Uh, there are programs in there to hire our veterans. We have the very least that we could do when our veterans come home from Iraq and Afghanistan is provide them with a job. Uh, and then there is an employee payroll tax. We're cutting that in half as well. So every working American will have a little extra money, $1,000, $1,500 in their pocket. So when you look at all of the elements of the American Jobs Act, it will create jobs right now. And that's the best path out of poverty. The other important component that I'm going to turn over to Melody, because this is really her expertise, is education. Maybe, would you like to talk a little bit about education? Ab absolutely. Thanks so much, Valerie. And thank you for having us here. And thank you all for being here. I think Valerie absolutely hit the nail on the head in talking about jobs as being, or the lack of jobs and unemployment being a significant contributor to poverty. But we also know that so many people were struggling long before our unemployment rates went up as significantly as they did. And when you look and take a snapshot and you think just eight, nine years ago, um, there were a number of people, uh, many people were working, but there were also a number of people who were really, really struggling in low income um, and high poverty communities. And we know that there are a range of different um, of problems that affect those individuals. Certainly education is one of them. The lack of educational attainment, the inability to get a good education, um, low, low performing, struggling schools that mean that year after year, uh, generation after generation, people are not getting education in a way that allows them to finish school, college, and career ready, and then continuing to struggle, unable to get high-paying jobs, jobs that have, uh, offer a level of security. That's a significant problem, and one that the president tackled early on, not only starting with K through 12 and some of the really innovative initiatives that we put in place there, but also looking before that, looking at those early years, zero to three years, where we know significant learning um, takes place, and we also know that often children enter kindergarten at a 60% uh, or 60 point achievement gap deficit. When you start kindergarten at a deficit, it means you're going to struggle throughout your educational um, uh, experience. And then for those who finish high school, even if you finish and you've received a good education, you have your diploma, you want to go on to college or some kind of two year or four year institution or get some additional certification so you'll be better qualified in, in the job market, a lot of students weren't able to get there because they couldn't have access, because college was simply unaffordable to them. And we, so we did a number of things to try and support them in those efforts, broadening the number of Pell Grants available, increasing the amount of Pell Grant awards, other ways that we could try and lift the loan burden off of students, which sure many of you have read and heard in recent days the reports of students struggling under the crushing debt of, of student loans. So I'll stop there, but there are a number of different factors that we know have contributed to poverty over the years, and this president has d told us to take a holistic approach as we try to address the problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, reader Drew Coleman has a question about the American Jobs Act and its work around unemployment benefits. Uh, will this legislation extend unemployment insurance for the very long-term employed who have already exhausted all state and federal benefits? So we're talking about the 99ers, of course, the workers who have not been able to find a job after, um, ex after exhausting their 99 weeks maximum of, of benefits. Um, and oftentimes after that 99 weeks is up, they sort of disappear from the federal, federal radar. So um, does this legislation do anything for them? And if, if they're not included, why not? Well, it does in the way that I described, in that we want to create this incentive for employers to hire the long-term unemployed. So anyone who's been unemployed longer than six months, again, employers will get an average of $4,000 per employee. And the teeth that we're putting in is prohibiting, and the American Jobs Act does this, prohibiting people from discriminating against the long-term unemployed. And then there are also funds in there to use our TANF benefits more flexibly to make sure that the long-term unemployed actually have the training that they need to prepare them for the jobs of tomorrow. And so when you look at it crafted that way, that's the way that the American Jobs Act is designed to help uh, the long-term unemployed. Okay. 
Um, so we also know that a major contributor to the loss of African American wealth has been the foreclosure crisis. And of course, this was triggered by banks and other lenders that targeted this community for subprime loans. Now, I understand that the administration is negotiating a settlement right now between states and the banks for those practices, but you're not pursuing prosecutions. Why not pursue stronger actions against the banks, and how is a settlement not effectively letting them off the hook? Well, one, we wanted to make sure that we are able to address the problem for those who have been struggling and for those who have been suffering and to turn around um, the practices that led to those problems as quickly as possible. Um, going, moving through the settlement process and negotiating with a number of states, and you know our, our Secretary of Housing and Urban Development um, has been a key in this uh, effort. Um, also our Secretary of Treasury. Um, this is an issue that's quite significant for us. So addressing the, the problems, ex uh, addressing the kinds of uh, initiatives that were taken on, you know, the robo signings and the other kinds of problems that led to uh, many people being foreclosed upon unnecessarily and, and inappropriately, we believe will take, will help those going forward and address those problems and also make sure that there are resources in place to address uh, the needs of those who want to, to refinance. So it's both helping those looking back and also helping those going forward and doing that in the most expeditious manner. Okay, well we're gonna take a few questions from Twitter now. Uh, they're being fielded by The Roots Deputy Editor Cheryl Huggins Salomon and Associate Editor Lauren Williams. And after that, our Managing Editor Joel Dreyfus will take questions from the audience. So first, we're going to start to take questions from Twitter. <laughs> well, that's a pretty simple question. <laughs> Thank you for asking it, though. I think the fact of the matter is in the, in the Republicans have been very forthcoming. They want to see the president fail. And I think what the president has said, and you've been hearing him loud and clearly saying this in the context of the American Jobs Act, people are suffering today. All across our country, families are struggling to make ends meet. They want a job, all they need is a little bit of help. And that's part of what government is supposed to do, is to give people help, provide them that safety net, give them the wherewithal to move um, out of poverty into self-sufficiency. And we don't have time to wait for the next election. People need help right now, they need it today. And so what the president is saying is, put politics aside and let's support what we know is gonna be good for America. And you know, these, these, everything that's in the American Jobs Act, and it's important to know, and the President said this when he first launched it, are historically programs and initiatives that have received bipartisan support. You know, funding for our teachers, infrastructure, uh, ways of making, investing in the United States to make us competitive. Mm -hmm. The tax cuts. The tax cuts for small businesses. And so right now, because the entire package did not pass last week, what the president has said is, well, we're going to come back with each component package. And so today, for example, uh, the Senate has called up jobs for teachers and first responders, firefighters, uh, police, every community across the country, cities and states have been so hard hit in terms of their budget. And so we want to make sure that these vital services are still provided. Our communities will be safe. Fires will be responded to. Our teachers will be in the classroom funding for 280,000 teachers. Let's see why the Republicans would vote against that. And let them explain. It's a tough thing to explain that you're not going to support that. So every week we're going to come back with different components of the American Jobs Act, force a vote, hold them accountable for why they would vote against it. And the only explanation we can think of would be that they just don't want to see the president succeed. This isn't about President Obama. This is about what's good for our country. And I, I would just add to that one of the interesting aspects of this is that well over a majority of the American people support the American Jobs Act. So that's Democrats, but that's also independents and Republicans. So I think the more that people are talking about this in their communities, they're talking to their mayors, they're talking to their members of Congress, that that will help contribute to a dialogue that hopefully will create momentum and move this forward. You know, I, I worked in Congress for about 10 years, and I know People count those phone calls, they pay attention to what their constituents are saying, and something that didn't seem possible before will be possible because people demand it, and people say we're hurting and we need action taken today. 
Okay, I want to follow up on that strategy of, of breaking the, the bill up mm -hmm. into chunks and then forcing a vote on each piece. Um, and I guess this is with the hopes that I guess the Republicans will lose their nerve and then start voting for them. Um, but for people who have been sort of observing this Congress, we've seen this very strong resolve against supporting uh, the Obama agenda. So do you have a plan B? And do you, or, or do you really think that they're going to start voting for these bills? And if not, do you have a plan B? Well, you know, one thing I remember last winter, we were heading into a lame duck after the election, and people said nothing is going to happen in the lame duck session, absolutely nothing. And instead, we passed one historic bill after another, including legislation that expanded um, tax credits that helped the most low-income Americans, um, also included the payroll tax cut that put about $1,000 in the pockets of most American families. On top of that, we also passed an international treaty. We repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, things that people a year ago probably would have said, or a year before that would have said will never happen. Again, that goes back to the moment and pushing and pushing and pushing, and that's what this president is resolved to do. Now, because of our system of government, because we can send legislation forth, the president can sign it into law, he can veto legislation, but he can't pass legislation. So if what is required legally um, to happen legislatively doesn't happen in Congress, then the president, though he's doing everything he can administratively, can't wave a magic wand to make it happen. So for changes in the law, we have to work with Congress and we have to continue to push Congress. Okay, I'm gonna kick it back to Twitter. Well, their voices, whether you're employed or unemployed, your voice counts and your stories count. I think part of what we have to do is really educate Congress and educate the broader community, our neighbors, our families, about what's at stake here and what the impact is. Each individual story is so important to highlight about what the impact of not having a job is, not just on you, but your family, your community, uh, the economy, Part of, what, part of the reason why we want to extend unemployment insurance is not just because it provides that important safety net for the individual and for their family, but it also provides a jolt to the economy. You're going to take that money and you're going to go out and you're going to spend it, and that's going to help the economy grow as well. And so I think what we are really trying to do and what the president did on his bus tour through both North Carolina and Virginia over the last few days and what he is going to continue to do until we um, have results is try to educate everybody about what's at stake here and the voices of the unemployed telling their story about what the impact, the personal story about how this affects them is very important and it's very compelling and it's helpful to tell the story around the country and we believe ultimately Congress will have to listen to those stories. The Republicans in Congress will have to listen to those stories. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, I'm gonna start off with a, some questions on cards that were handed in by the audience. The question is from somebody concerned about states like Ohio that have lost so much of their industrial base. Do you have any plans to try to revive some of the traditional industrial jobs in addition to the new technologies and the green tech and all of those things that, sh that the president has talked about? Well, you know, just last week the president was in Detroit and this applies to Ohio as well. What, what the president did by investing in the automotive industry, Chrysler and, uh, and making sure that Chrysler and GM had the resources that they needed to come back really from brink of disaster. And now the plant we were in in Detroit, which was pretty much shuttered, is now back to full speed ahead. All throughout Ohio, the same thing. The automotive industry is now back and profitable in this country because of the steps that the president took. And at the time that he took it, people thought this was a very unpopular decision. Well, why would you invest in a dying industry? Well, you know what? Our automotive industry is not dying. It's far from it. We were in Detroit last week with the president of South Korea, who was speaking so favorably about the free trade agreement, which is going to open up even more possibilities for our cars to be sold all over the world, and particularly in South Korea as a result of this agreement. So yes, we are absolutely committed to manufacturing. And, and part of what makes our country great is that we have to be diverse in our interests. We can't just focus on 
one segment. We can't just do high tech. We can't just do advanced manufacturing. We need a diverse industry. And the president is absolutely committed to making sure that we have that diverse industry and that we have a workforce that is prepared for the jobs of tomorrow. Melody mentioned how important it is that we're working with our community colleges. We have an initiative where employers are helping design the curriculum. The manufacturing jobs that were in existence when I was a child are very different than the manufacturing jobs of today. You have to be computer literate. A lot of this is done autom automatically. Um, and so it's important that as we train people for the manufacturing jobs of tomorrow, that they have the skill set to go with it. And we're committed to working with the private sector, who are ultimately the people who are going to be hiring, to make sure that they have a workforce that's prepared to compete in this century. And I, I just want to add one more thing to what Valerie was saying and using the automotive industry as, as the example. When we were going through this process of working um, with the, the auto industry and people were saying it can't be done, people were saying just let them go, which not only would have affected workers there, but all the workers that, that surround that industry. Not only did the president say we can't do that, but he said when we do it, we have to do it in a smart way. This is a traditional industry, one that has helped support a middle class um, in these communities for, million, for millions, for, for decades. But at the same time, we had to think about what kind of automobiles are we producing so that we are competitive in a global economy. So you look at the work that we were doing at the same time around fuel efficiency and the negotiation around cars and also around trucks um, that took place last year and again this year so that those automobiles are competitive globally and will support that industry. So it's not only thinking how do we um, in, invest in smart manufacturing and maintain our manufacturing base, it's also how do we do it in a way that people are going to want to buy what we in fact are trying to sell. And that also goes into this clean energy economy that the president is supporting. How do we create an industry and support an industry that is going to um, ensure that we are producing things that people will want to buy around the globe and we can compete with others who are doing the same thing? Okay, we'll take another audience Yeah, question. there's a two, que two similar questions that ask about the balancing of jobs and the impact on the environment. Uh, I have a gentleman here from the Sierra Club, uh, Quentin James. Can you raise your hand? There he is. There he is. Mm -hmm. Quentin wants to know, um, hang on here. How do you create jobs uh, without uh, hurt, uh, hurt, sacrificing the health and safety of Americans? Well, it's, it is easy to do both. And I think oftentimes you'll hear that you, it's one or the other. It's absolutely both. A good example of the way we can do it is some, an idea that came from our the President's Jobs and Competitiveness Council, and that's retrofitting buildings. Creates jobs, we're going in there, we're making them more energy efficient. Uh, we're looking for, right now, a way of targeting about 14 different projects around the country where we can expedite the permitting process so that we can get these buildings retrofitted faster uh, and get people to work quicker. And so that's a simple example of where you can do both. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a false choice. There's absolutely no reason why we can't, as Melody was saying, the work we did with the automotive industry, making these cars uh, fuel efficient is good for the environment. And producing a product that people want to buy is going to be good for creating jobs as well. So we can do both. OK, next question comes from reader Beverly Campbell. What can be done about ending credit checks for jobs and other hiring practices that discriminate against the poor and unemployed? And I understand that the American Jobs Act proposes legislation that would end these kinds of practices, but how, how is that designed? What does that law look like? Well, we know, and so many people have told us um, from around the country, and you all may have seen them yourselves, um, these postings, um, these billboards, announcements in newspapers, that if you've been un unemployed for X amount of time, don't apply for the job. And what this president insisted that we do is prohibit those kinds of practices. So that just because a person has fallen on hard times in a very, very tough economy, as people are trying to make their way back, the fact that you haven't been employed won't stand as a barrier to you being employed. And there are other parts of the American Jobs Act that work to make sure that people can maintain their skills and to get job training and on the job training so that those skills that tend to atrophy as people are unemployed won't be lost. And including innovations and modernization of our unemployment insurance um, programs so that people can continue to work, that we're using those funds and states have uh, flexibility and there's innovation 
um, for those funds to be used so that there's uh, work sharing, so that there's wage insurance um, for people who may be taking a job that was slightly, uh, that's playing less than their, their previous job did, um, so they won't um, continue to slide um, down the economic ladder. So we're doing a number of things to try and support people, but mainly making sure that that prohibition or those kind, those uh, nasty, unfortunate employment practices are prohibited. I would say uh, one of the hats that I wear as chair of the White House Council on Women and Girls. So many uh, women, particularly, who've been out of the workforce for a long time because of the economy um, are, or just because of choice are wanting to get back into the workforce. And so we have to provide them with the skills that they need to get back in. But we also need to make sure that employers are not discriminating against them. So even putting the, putting, uh, the fact that they're discriminating against long-term unemployed aside, within that class, women are facing a huge obstacle as well. And so we need to do what we can to make sure that they can get back into the workforce. OK, now the link. Oh, this is from reader Oscar Scott. The link between lack of education and poverty is well proven. And despite the president's goal of a college-ready, college-educated population, every student isn't going to go to college. What policies will the administration implement to increase access to vocational and technical training? Sure. Well, first of all, the president's goal, the president has a couple of goals. I mean, one of them is ensuring by the year 2020 we have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. That is a critical goal because we know that we've been sliding backwards in that. Um, that we also know that the vast majority of jobs that are coming online, jobs over the next 5, 10, 15 years, will require some kind of post-secondary education. At the same time, his other goal is that we are graduating students college and career ready. So that understands that not every student is going to a four-year institution or wants to, but that we are preparing students to enter two-year institutions and also receive some kind of certification, um, additional training to be ready for the, the jobs that we've been talking about this afternoon. We've done that in any number of ways. Our support for community colleges, which is really historic, uh, I think never before has an administration supported communi community colleges in such a full-throated way. In fact, we just announced a couple of weeks ago about $500 million going to community colleges to make sure they're innovating, that their curriculum, um, they're thinking about online training, the additional services that many students may need, particularly those who may be a little older and have families, that those are, are all aligned with students being able to get jobs uh, in the future and jobs that are actually in existence. I know the president said to us, you know, I know it sounds simple, Melody, but when a person gets a certificate, when a person finishes a two-year program, there should be a job on the other side waiting for them. We've also partnered actively with the private sector to do this. There's a program called Skills for America's Future um, that uh, it was born out of an earlier iteration of the President's um, Jobs Council. And that is a partnership that, again, works with community colleges, works with employers to make sure that students are getting the kind of education that they need and that it's meeting the need that actually exists, the demand that exists in the market. On career and technical education, that's an area that we focused on and we've said there have been reorganizations around CTE, but those reorganizations, while important, we think we can get better results. We can get even uh, increased results out of that. And the Department of Education um, is working towards uh, a uh, reform of that area that ensures that skills are aligned with what's uh, on the other end and that students, again, are getting a college and career ready education. Okay, next question comes from Maria Holt. Why is the administration just now addressing poverty? Now, I'll, I'll build on that a little bit. I think, um, you know, because I'm sure you'll say we've always been addressing poverty, but what prompted the White House to draft the Pathways out of, uh, or I'm sorry, Pathways to Opportunity mm -hmm. Report um, and also the American Jobs Act? Because I think a lot of people are thinking, where was this conversation? Where was this bill a year ago? And why now? Sure. Well, we decided to draft the report in many ways to respond to what people like uh, the, the viewer, um, the writer, is saying to us. Uh, they, people were asking, what have you done? And we knew that we had been doing quite a bit over the last couple of years, but we needed to put that together in a way that was digestible, in a way that could, people could see it all in one place. We were responding to you. We were responding to the people who are watching this right now. But again, because that report was just released within the last week, doesn't mean to your point, you're absolutely right, um, that we would say that we haven't been doing anything 
to address this need. In fact, we've been trying to address it from day one. The predecessor, yes, the American Jobs Act is the focus um, right now for the president for the reasons that Valerie has described. But remember, within a couple of months of coming into this uh, administration, walking into the White House, we passed the Recovery Act. And in the Recovery Act, we had the expansions of ta tax credits for low income, for those who are the working poor. Uh, we also included subsidized jobs, another piece that's also in the American Jobs Act. We know that it works because we passed it in the, the stimulus bill, so we thought it was important to do again. Summer jobs for youth, 16 to 24 year, years old. We know that people aren't just doing this because they, they think work is a good thing and they, they would like to do so and earn a little extra money. We know that a lot of young people are doing this so that they can help support their families. All of this goes on and on and on. Passing health care reform, another important um, and signature piece of legislation to make sure that people not only have uh, affordable health care, but people have access to health care that they didn't have before, that you don't go bankrupt because you get sick. So the list of things that we've done over the past two and a half years is quite substantial. The need is still very great. We continue to press forward, but we've been working on this since we set foot in the White House. I think it's a fair um, critique to say one of our challenges is getting information out. I often will travel around the country and I'll talk to small businesses and they aren't even aware of the tax advantages that we've passed, 17 different um, tax breaks for small businesses. And so part of what we have to do is be better messengers and by pulling all of this information um, so well into one booklet the way Melody and her team have done, I think is a very important step for helping us communicate. And we need to do more of that, but it's really more an opportunity, as, as Mel said, for us to respond to people saying, well, what exactly have you done? Well, now you can go and you can look at this booklet. And keep in mind, we're not done. We're going to keep going. We're always looking for new ideas. If anyone here has suggestions, if you have a small business and there's something more that we could do to incentivize you to invest and grow and create jobs, if you're unemployed and you think that there's a particular way that we could design a program to meet your needs, part of why we wanted to do this with The Root is to engage and to have a conversation and to get new ideas. The president, as Mel could tell you, has this insatiable appetite for anything that's going to move our country forward. And there are no bad ideas. He's interested in hearing, he was interested in hearing from the Republicans if they had good ideas. As it is right now, they haven't come forth with something. But we are open to good suggestions from wherever they come. And I would just say the Pathways to Opportunity report doesn't reflect everything, even everything that we've done. Um, in that report, we've tried to describe some of the new initiatives, the, the signature Obama administration initiatives, but that sits on top of uh, efforts and initiatives and legislation and policy that's been in place for a while that we've continued to support. Um, so you put all that together and we've been working to try and address the needs of low-income Americans. Okay, I'm gonna bring it over to Twitter. Um, so, Kazia M.W., she wants to know what the administration is doing to assist the self-employed. Well, in fact, in, in the American Jobs Act, um, there is a provision, uh, as, we, as I was talking about modernizing the uh, unemployment insurance program, that helps those who have been unemployed but also see this as an opportunity to perhaps to start a business. Um, and providing resources to those individuals um, for a period of time. If, if things don't work out, and we know it's tough starting your own business, um, the ability to um, go back and to continue to receive those benefits if they're needed. Um, there are also programs at the Small Business Administration, at the Department of Labor, and elsewhere that support those who want to start their own businesses. We believe entrepreneurship um, is a great engine um, in the United States, and, and the President wants to do everything to be supportive of it. One of the ideas that came from the, uh, the President's uh, Jobs and Competitiveness Council was to really drill down and focus on how to start up America. And so Steve Case, the founder of AOL, mm -hmm. has started a new 501c3 called Startup America. And it's uh, designed to bring together 
entrepreneurs, former entrepreneurs, people who know what it's like to begin with nothing, you know, starting in your garage, starting in your basement, and take it to scale and try to figure out what are the barriers to entry? What, is it access to capital? Is it technical training? Is it, a, is it a capital that's affordable? Is it lending from the banks, from the Small Business Administration, as Melody said? Is it uh, finding a workforce that you need uh, at a price that you can afford? What are all of the components that, it, that, it, that are essential in order for you to start a business? Are you, um, have you never exported before, but you're interested in exporting? The president also has an export council that's working very closely with Steve Case to figure out how we can help companies that are making terrific uh, goods or services right here in America, but imagine what could happen if they could export to one country or two countries or three countries. So we want to provide that opportunity. The president has made a commitment to double U.S. exports in five years. Uh, so we're already a year into that commitment. What more can we do to open up those opportunities? The free trade agreements that he will sign tomorrow for South Korea, Panama, and Colombia will open up new opportunities. Uh, and you know, the United States is one market. There's a whole world out there. And companies from all over the world are competing with our companies. What can we do to help them compete? That's the president's priority. Let's take a question, oh. direct question from the audience. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I, my big question would be if you could identify three issues that are currently out there in the media through political parties that are being touted as the truth, um, are, but they're not really true or um, they could be kind of twisted as the truth, how could you, what would those be and how would you refute them and, and really make an articulate statement to dispel those myths that are um, being touted about the administration? Well, I t would take one the Recovery Act, the stimulus bill, um, and there is an, ac an argument, which isn't true, um, that it didn't create jobs. And in fact, we know that it created or saved about 3.5 million jobs, in addition to all the other things uh, that I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, in terms of the tax credits and, and a number of other subsidized jobs, a number of other things um, that have been helping the American people. Uh, we spent a lot of time, the Vice President, the President, going around the country talking about the benefits um, of the Recovery Act, um, but I think that that's, that's one myth um, that exists out there that, that simply isn't true. Another one would be the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. There are 34 million people in our country who are going to have health insurance as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Already there are a million young people my daughter having been one of them for a period of time, who I was able to put on my insurance because when she finished law school, she didn't have a job for three months. And so a million young people right now, right now today, are on their parents' insurance as a result of that. Making sure that children currently who have pre-existing conditions cannot be discriminated against by insurance companies. So many of us know people who have children who have been ill, and the last thing that you should have to think about when you have an ill child is whether or not they're going to get dumped from their insurance or whether they're going to come up against a lifetime cap because they have an illness that began when they were very young. Making sure that we have affordable, quality health insurance in a country that's the richest country in the world, there's absolutely no excuse for us not having it. So the Affordable Care Act is going to touch every family around the country. And a lot of what uh, the Republicans and critics have said about it from the beginning is just simply not true. And we are convinced that as people start to experience the benefits of it, they'll see what's reality. I was in South Carolina a few weeks ago, and a guy came up to me and he handed me something. I thought it was a business card, because people do hand us business cards all the time. It wasn't. It was his health insurance card. And he said he had cancer. And prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, he couldn't get insurance. Now he's able to get insurance. You, you know, it's interesting. I had the same experience. I was, ladies can relate to this, coming out of my hair salon. And uh, the receptionist, who I've known for quite some time, came racing down the steps after me. And she grabbed me and she said, is it true that now a child with a pre-existing condition can't be kicked out of um, health care, can access health care insurance? And I said, yes, it is true. And she said, really? I said, really? And she said, you don't know what this means to me. Her daughter is about three years old now. She said, I've been trying to get health insurance for her since day one, and we haven't been able to do it. This is, this is a godsend to me. But, and I'll also say a third myth, that the president is anti-business. 
I mean, that one I think really just drives us crazy. I mean, one, the president has talked about this, and he believes in our system. He believes in our market-based system. He believes in small business and entrepreneurship um, and the engine that they create for innovation and jobs and making us competitive um, globally. Um, he uh, in, engages with and has brought business leaders here um, to have con to talk to them about better ways that we can make our markets um, and our, our products more competitive globally. At the same time, he believes that we have to balance that with the needs, um, the uh, health care, health related and safety needs of workers and consumers. But he believes in our system and he believes that by creating jobs and supporting businesses that we are also able to make sure that American workers have greater security. But we have to balance those things and we have to do it in a smart way. Okay, um, so Melody, you surprised your colleagues today with the mm -hmm. announcement that you'll be leaving the White House at the yes. end of the year. Mm -hmm. Surprised and saddened her colleagues <laughs> today, I would add. And you know, you've been with the Domestic Policy Council from the mm -hmm. very beginning of the administration and obviously at a very challenging time. So I want to know what you think is the most impactful policy that you've helped develop during your time. You know, that's almost like asking you to pick among your children. You know, which, <laughs> which one do you love the most? Uh, and I, I think one of, well, first of all, I'll say this. I remember when I, I took the job and, uh, you know, little old ladies at my church would come up and say, baby, we're so proud of you, but woo, all that stuff you've got to cover. Um, and, <laughs> You know, the domestic policy landscape is so broad, and it's everything from education to the work we do on immigration, the world work we've done on childhood obesity and fighting, uh, fighting that, uh, civil rights work. I mean, the list goes on and on, healthcare, energy, and I've been thrilled to work on all of those issues. And as I was telling my team um, today, the, our ability to drive that forward um, because the president has given us um, the room and demanded that we do these things and create opportunity for the American public um, has been so significant. And I think we have been able to make changes, even though there's so much work to be done. Um, I would say one of the issues that I'm very proud of is the work that we've been able to do around education. Um, and it is that three-legged stool, early education, K through 12, and higher education. Because I believe, and I think, and many of you probably had this experience, I know it's true for my family, that education has made such a significant difference. You know, when I look at my, my dad who went to college on the GI Bill, and went to college, he was working at the same time he graduated when I was a little girl. We used to go to the library together. I think that's where my love for education um, and books was really uh, deepened. Um, my mother, who worked so hard on scholarship, um, her mother, who worked in a tobacco factory, um, but worked to save their money to put my mother through school, and her love for education and work as an educator. And it's changed, it's changed my life. I mean, those are, are my beginnings, and now I've been able to work for the President of the United States. Education changes lives, it changes communities. It is important that it be coupled with all the things that we've been talking about today, but that's one example of something that I'm very, very proud to have worked on. I want to say something about Mel, since you opened up the topic. Go ahead. <laughs> because, uh, well, first of all, one of the things I have enjoyed most about being a part of the Obama administration is having a chance to work so closely with Melody, and not only is her depth and breadth of understanding of the complicated policy issues and how they all fit together second to none. I don't know anyone, and I know a lot of folks in this space who have the mastery that Mel does, but more important than that, and I think you just heard it, is her passion and her commitment and her drive and her willingness to work 24 hours a day, seven <laughs> days a week. And when you do that over a long period of time, at some point you have to put your head up and say, okay, let me take a breath now. But President Obama and the First Lady, because Melody has also been very involved in the First Lady's Let's Move initiative, um, are just so grateful to her service to, uh, to the President's administration, but to our country. And so she is the consummate public servant in the true meaning of the word, and we just owe her, and our country owes her, a debt of gratitude. And if I go much further, we'll both start crying. Yeah, no. so <laughs> Thank you. So we're about to conclude our live stream, and I want to thank the online audience for tuning in. And please continue to visit us at theroot.com for daily reporting and commentary on these issues and others. Um, and thank you again for joining us. And we're going to take more questions now from the audience.